It's amazing how widely known it is globally. You know, I'll go to give a lecture in Germany or overseas somewhere and I'll start with a general introduction of what ELA is and I'll get a lot of nods, you know, sort of urging me on like, yeah, we know this already. So I chose the Experimental Lakes area because it is unique. There's no, at least no other place that I know of in the world where you can do whole ecosystem experiments at a whole lake scale. We can try to understand a lot by sampling them from the environment and trying to figure out things around fate, degradation, impacts, but you cannot get kind of the complexity that you get here. ELA started out as a, a government-only institution. Its new beginnings under uh, IISD really allowed it to uh, spread its wings, to work with a, a broader range of, uh, of actors, including the private sector, foundations, even other countries, and share this, uh, this great uh, research and knowledge that they uh, produce on freshwater uh, with the world. You work within a government structure and there's obviously some limitations. And now we have the latitude to be able to work on a number of different environmental compartments. And in fact, we, try, we like to say that we work on the entire ecosystem, right? we consider the entire ecosystem. So that latitude to be able to draw in collaborators from other realms, I mean, it really, it really enhances your ability to look at the whole ecosystem, you know. So we're allowed to think more holistically and less in a box than we were with, uh, with the government. The experimental lake area came to me uh, through an article that I read. And the article indicated how important uh, this organization was up in northern Ontario, at Kenora, and the fact that they were running into financial trouble. And therefore, I thought, well, um, I really liked what they were trying to do. I didn't know that much about it, but it certainly sounded like a, a wonderful operation that needed some support. Not that I was able to give them that much, but I gave them what I could at that time and then decided to make that an annual gift. We talk, we converse, we share ideas, we clarify thinking. When uh, contemplating what project they would work on, they would come to decision when they knew that whatever issue they were dealing with and whatever they had to add to the waters to find the answers that they were seeking, that they would be able to clean up their mess when they were done. And if they could not see a way to clean their mess, then they wouldn't entertain disturbing the waters. I think that's such a beautiful thing. When I started my environmental education journey, I was like, I'm only going to be outside, I'm going to just do all of these things, nature based and all that kind of stuff. And then I was like, maybe I want to be inside. And that's kind of where that classroom learning came. And so I'd worked a couple of jobs and then I got this job with Experimental Lakes Area. And I really got the opportunity to do both. So getting to bring the hands-on learning into the classroom kind of clicked in my brain and was like, yeah, you can be a teacher and still get to make connections with other organizations that are already doing amazing work and still being able to showcase students that maybe can't make it out to the site. What I got to experience is so special to me and I love being able to share uh, the knowledge that I learned and the resources that ELA has. The staff at IISD, obviously here at the Experimental Lakes area, a lot of staff are scientists, but there's also a whole policy group at IISD who I collaborate with quite a bit. And uh, they need diverse science coming to the table in order to inform those decisions. And so we can work in a vacuum with the scientists that are here, but we absolutely need to be collaborating with people across Canada, from other countries, um, bringing in that diverse knowledge to be able to answer these complex questions. It also brings a lot of credibility to the science we do if we're working with researchers all over the world who might be experts in contaminant X or you know, climate change issue, overfishing, whatever it is. So there's huge value um, to having people understand how amazing this place is and come here and start to work with us.
The oil transportation industry and the oil production industry in Canada, uh, back when we started our oil spill studies, was interested in potentially using a shoreline cleaner. So we did some testing with that shoreline cleaner, you know, in collaboration with the oil industry, in collaboration with the oil transportation industry. And what we found was that that shoreline cleaner was not very effective at removing oil from shorelines. So that was the first, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work very well. The second thing we found was it's quite damaging to invertebrate populations. So once we provided that data, the oil production and transportation industries backed off and said, oh, okay, this is not going to be viable for us. We'll abandon that. And in fact, in the interim since then, the manufacturer of that particular shoreline cleaner is no longer manufacturing it. So it's very rare that you see your science result in immediate action by you know, the proponents and the producers of a specific product. So that was really validating too. Probably the biggest change that I've seen is the influx of youth. And it's really validating to see a lot of the young scientists, and some of the whom have trained with us as graduate students, come in and be you know, permanent members of our staff, and it's great. We Canadians, we take uh, fresh water for granted. Uh, Canada is the home of 20% of the world's fresh water. And uh, we now have a Canada Water Agency located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And um, I'm excited about uh, the opportunities for the Canada Water Agency, as well as uh, ISDELA, to work together on the solutions to some of our, uh, our water challenges in this country. So for example, the science we do can inform how much plastic there is in the environment, how it changes over time, the sources of the microplastics to the environment uh, so that you can mitigate those sources. Um, but it can also help you understand the impacts at certain amounts. And if we understand the impacts, we can inform the urgency of the policy. And if we understand the way plastics move around, the sources of the material, we can actually inform the policies that we do to prevent it. I would, I would uh, advise anybody encourage anybody to take the time, even though it's a little far away, to go and visit the ELA site and see firsthand uh, what I'm talking about as far as being encouraged and being comfortable that the money that you're giving is being spent very, very well. They're building on something and we can keep coming back to the fact that water is one of the essential parts of, of our human being and therefore what better uh, could you support than, than something as essential to life as that? ELA is not here to cause harm. It's here to work towards solutions. In asking the questions, how can we help you raise uh, Manitoua Kianaka Nagewin so that any others that want to come in and touch the land, disturb um, the forest, disturb whatever, knows that they must first enter into an, uh, into an understanding and a, pr a process with Grand Council Treaty 3 using the process that we've outlined with uh, the principles and the uh, four R's and working together for solutions for the next seven generations.